welcome to the award session. Uh, those who missed the, uh, the welcome uh, comments yesterday, I'm Annemieke Aert, the president of the OTS, and it's really my privilege um, to do the awards session today. Um, so before we go into the awards, um, a brief uh, uh, introduction for people that live in the US or Canada. There's obtain funding, uh, the o uh, Ono Pharmaceutical Foundation Awards um, are possible again. Um, it gives you up to 300 here for up to three years. So this is a really good opportunity. And if you have questions, then uh, David Corey and Masad Dama are ambassadors of this award. So feel free to reach out to them for, with questions. So there's one award that was not yet announced, and that's the Next Gen Session Award. So if you were there on Sunday, um, there were six talks from uh, junior presenters, and uh, we could know who we thought was the best presenters. Now, all presenters received votes, but there was also a very clear winner. And I'm happy to announce that the Next Gen Session Best Talk Award is James Thorpe for his uh, talk about scalable synthesis of DNA and RNA oligomers uh, using mechanochemistry. So James, congratulations. And OTS will be in contact with you about this. So then uh, briefly a thank you to the award committee. So the, the jury members and advisors really put in reviewing uh, the, 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 the nominations. Um, and uh, special thanks to Erin McConnell because uh, she is the committee chair. She, uh, organized everything, made sure everything happened on time. And I think if you're a, uh, a, a trainee uh, or a junior member considering to become a trainee board member, please talk to us. She really used this opportunity well and she really did a very good job chairing this award committee. So then we, we move to the awards. Um, paper of the Year awards are on the You can go to the website to view this. And the first paper uh, is in the basic category and it goes to uh, and co-authors for investigation, the pharmacodynamic durability of Gelnar. And as it happens, Fassant, uh, we have a live connection to Fassant. We can go there and then give a virtual applause to Fassant for this, uh, this award. Thank you, Anamike. This is the plant that we received. From we want to thank you, OTS, uh, and uh, and the committee for recognizing this work. We're especially proud that this is in the basic research category uh, coming for the work uh, from the biotech. I want to thank my co-authors uh, and collaborators at MGH, especially to Chris Brown, uh, who did this work at Alilam. So thank you again. Okay, well, congratulations. And there's a virtual applause for you. And I see also in the chat that people are so really nice. We also have two uh, three, uh, papers that were uh, that were won winning a vaccine from Pfizer and Moderna. A lot of people involved, so congratulations to everyone involved as well. And if you want to know more, there are on-demand talks that you can see about that. Then the Lifetime Achievement Awards, there will be no lectures for that um, in the virtual meeting. We announced uh, uh, two years ago that won the 2020 OTS uh, Lifetime Achievement Award, and we announced last year that Frank Bennett had won the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award. But when they heard that this year would be virtual, they said both of them said that they prefer to have an in-person Lifetime Achievement Award session. So what we'll do, celebrate them both next year. There will be two award session in in next year's meeting, and then we will skip the lifetime achievement award uh, uh, for one year. So there will be only two lifetime achievement award lectures next year, and then there will be a new lifetime achievement 2023. Um, so now to the part where we are going to hear from the award winners for work, and we start with the Ellen Award Scholarship Awards. Um, in, in uh, memory of uh, Ellen Gowers, one of the founders of our um, society, also really was uh, uh, an advocate of, of junior members and, and, and junior researchers. Um, so the first one is students, and this one goes to Hassan Faki from McGill University. And Hassan got his bachelor degree in chemistry from the American University in Beirut. 
Um, he then joined the Sleeman lab uh, um, in McGill University to pursue uh, his doctorate degree. And he focuses on RNA-based nanocarriers for oligonucleotide delivery. And in addition, he's also interested in scientific communication. And in fact, I or I'm not a chemist, but I remember last year that I could understand this presentation quite well. So very well with that. Looking forward to hearing his talk. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today to listen to my talk, which is titled Sequence Controlled DNA Polymer Conjugates for the Delivery of Nucleic Acid Therapeutics. I would like to start my talk with one slide to thank each and every one, uh, I'm sure every person slide. Um, and from, uh, from all the groups that I've worked with, including the NAMA group, the Holorova group, and of uh, the Steaming group. And uh, I want to say that uh, without them, I wouldn't produce all of this work and then uh, get this uh, prestigious award. Thank you very much. I won't take uh, much of your time explaining to you uh, what nucleic acid therapeutics are, because I'm pretty sure that the audience is very familiar with uh, ASOs, SRNAs, the CRISPR-Cas9 system, and many others. And then the challenges that are impeding nucleic acid therapeutics from reaching their full potential, which are their activity and specificity, their stability, as well as their biodistribution and endosomal escape. The first two challenges actually have been uh, resolved uh, uh, using this huge chemical toolbox that uh, chemists have developed as modifications for nucleic acid therapeutics, which has improved greatly on the stability and in some cases the activity and specificity of these nucleic acid therapeutics. However, the bottleneck remains for nucleic acid therapeutics to reach their full potential is uh, their biodistribution beyond the liver as well as endosomal escape. One attractive solution for these issues is using drug delivery vehicles that are able to encapsulate nucleic acid therapeutics or deliver them in a spatiotemporal um, controlled behavior uh, to the specific uh, target in, in place and then where they can be active. And uh, drug delivery vehicles are an are attractive solution mainly because they improve on the efficacy of our therapeutic. They reduce cytotoxicity by eliminating unwanted effects. They also can be functionalized with many interesting properties such as, tar such as targeting and stimuli responsive behavior, as well as co-delivering multiple drugs together. Mainly interested uh, in DNA-based nanocarriers, Building these nanocarriers from DNA or nucleic acids uh, makes the material biocompatible. It's programmable and controllable in size and shape, mainly due to the specific uh, base pairing that we know of nucleic acids, as well as the ease of functionalization and production of this material using automated synthesis. Some examples of DNA-based nanocarriers include similar responsive DNA cages that are able to encapsulate SRNAs. Uh, similar responsive DNA origami robots that can form uh, different shapes and encapsulate drugs inside, as well as spherical nucleic acid, which have a solid core and a, and a, a nucleic acid corona. I was particularly interested in spherical nucleic acids that have been shown to have higher affinity towards their target. They're less susceptible to nucleases. They have been shown to have uptake into a wide spectrum of sunlight, as well as biodistribution beyond the liver in some instances. In our lab, we've actually there developed our own way to produce spherical nucleic acid using a method called sequence controlled DNA polymer conjugates. In brief, the, what we do is we utilize the DNA synthesizer, but instead of adding uh, bases uh, one by one, we're now adding monomers of polymers, such as the one shown here, which is a hexaethylene or a C12 unit. And we're able to add that in a very high yield, uh, in a very high yield step. And, uh, and we can actually add multiple monomers of polymers as well. In one instance, when we added 12 units uh, in a linear fashion of this hexaethylene unit, this DNA polymer conjugate was able to assemble into well-defined spherical nucleic acids. And the interesting thing about these SNAs is that they are made from a single component. They're automated. Uh, they're produced in an automated fashion. They're made from biocompatible material. They're highly monodispersed, as well as they also have a hydrophobic core that can be uh, utilized for dual delivery of small molecules, for example. Indeed, early studies of these SNAs uh, by Danny Busnail and Johannes Fakhouri in our lab has shown that these SNAs actually have, can encapsulate small molecule drugs, can go inside cells and have an interesting bite distribution uh, profile, and they're also monodispersed, as well as the, the ASO, uh, the nucleic acid portion of, of uh, the conjugate can be used as an ASO, for example, that's able to do gene silencing in cells. However, the vital consideration for nucleic acid delivery nanocarriers is that we have to ensure that these 
SNAs or any nanoparticle in general has specificity and is increasing in the stability and activity uh, uh, present to the therapeutic by itself. It has desired by the desired by distribution in vivo as well. It can be produced in an easy and simple manner for preclinical applications. So the outline of the projects that I'm going to be touching uh, lightly on today are uh, uh, responsive spherical nucleic acid uh, made, uh, made from the DNA polymer conjugate, where we focus on optimizing the carrier. Then we move into FANA-modified spherical nucleic acids, which, are, which we focus on the therapeutic optimization. And last but not least, a different kind of a DNA polymer conjugate with different properties than SNAs. So for the first project, the response of SMEs, the inspiration started with working from doc with Dr. Catherine Bujold, who was interested in this idea that cancer cells overexpress not only one, but multiple microRNAs that are key uh, genetic markers for cancer cells. And what she did is she tried to implement this and produce a similar responsive behavior into a DNA prism shown here where you encapsulate your siRNA strand in green here in the cavity of the prism, it is partially bound to these red strands of the prism. And only in the presence of the microRNAs, which are specific to these cancer cells, these microRNAs are fully complementary and they're gonna invade the prism in order to release the siRNA so that it can be active. And this happens by a mechanism called strand displacement, where your fully complementary strands will push out your partially complementary strand to release the green strand, which is in this case was the siRNA and form the more stable product. Now, for Catherine to use this uh, in biological context, she had to make a lot of modifications to this prism. And while this prism is attracted by having a similar responsive behavior and has bispecificity, however, it is heavily modified, which made it expensive. It's made from many components, I believe, which are eight strands, and it's also small in size, which can, which can lead to renal clearance. However, if you focus here with me on uh, the main interesting feature of this design is this stimuli responsive behavior relies mainly on this hybridization of the siRNA to these two red strands. So what I try to do is to make responsive nucleic acids similar to this design. So we start with these two pillar strands, which are DNA polymer conjugates. We partially hybridize this bridge here, which are color coded shown here to the pillar strands. And then what we do is we assemble this into a spherical nucleic acid, and then we add our therapeutic, which can hybridize to the yellow strand here on the bridge. And hopefully what you would end up with is this responsive SNA or RSNA that has this corona. It will also be able to release its uh, therapeutic uh, based uh, on a similar responsive behavior as I showed you earlier. Now the attractive thing about this design is that we have specificity, desired by distribution by having SNAs which are larger than the prism, and we have stability via 3D structure as well as simplicity via less components. Now we're only using four or three components. So first we make sure that actually making such a design we still have a spherical nucleic acid. So we characterize our fully assembled RSNA and we also characterize the other structures. But I'm only showing you here the final product which has a diameter of 32 nanometers and it has a spherical shape as shown here by atomic force microscopy. So that was great. And then next, what we tested is do we actually still have the similar responsive behavior? And this is, uh, we did it uh, using uh, gel electrophoresis, where in lane one, we start with our fully assembled SNA. And in lanes two and three, we're adding the triggers or the, the trigger strands one, uh, one by one individually. So we don't have them both in the same sample. And you don't see any release of the therapeutic. However, in lane number four, we add both trigger strands together, you have a release uh, of your therapeutic, uh, which indicates that we do have bispecificity and stimuli responsive behavior, which requires both triggers to be present. Next, we tested that actually, if we have improved uh, stability in biological conditions, so we incubated our SNA or the bridge by itself in serum containing media, and we took different aliquots at different time points. And what we were able to see actually is that we improved the uh, stability uh, of our, uh, of our uh, cargo against degradation up to six hours in comparison to um, uh, immediate degradation in the first hour of the bridge when it's present by itself. And this is shown here by uh, plotting the band densities over here. So indeed, being part of the SNA improves stability in biological media. And last but not least, what we wanted to test is what we call the activation on demand, which is basically when you add, uh, we wanted to test, do we actually have gene sinus activity only when we release our therapeutic from the structure? So what we did is we made an ASO against luciferase, 
RNA and we hybridized it to our SNA. And then only in, this, in the cells that have been pre-transfected with the trigger strands that I showed you earlier, we, sh we see a, a, a release of our therapeutic and uh, around 50% silencing, indicating that we only have activity after release. So for this project, hopefully I was able to show you that we are able to design these similar responsive SNAs that have uh, increased cargo protection and can be activated in the presence of a specific stimulus. Next, we're going to move to the second project where we focus on therapeutic optimization, which is the fan modified SNAs. So in this project, if you remember the last experiment that I showed you, we had about 50% silencing of our target, and we weren't satisfied by this, and we were thinking, how can we improve on this, uh, on, on this activity? And the way, and actually, we were surprised that back when we were working on this project, that our SNAs, as well as other SNAs reported in the literature, only use phosphorothyroid backbone modification to improve the stability of SNAs and their activity. I showed you earlier, there's a huge chemical modification toolbox that we can use and chemists have developed over the past 20 years uh, that can improve on efficacy and stability. We were particularly interested in one of them, which is the phantom modification, which is a two prime fluoro arabinose modification that has been shown to, to increase stability and nucleus resistance. It has RNAs H, RNAs H activity when it's part of an ASO strand and also improves binding toward our target. The second motivation for us to work with FANA actually is because it has been pioneered by our neighbors in the chemistry department at McGill. So we were, we were really excited to pick up this collaboration. So what we decided to do is to just focus on FANA modified spherical nucleic acid uh, using this design. So there's no similar responsive behavior. So the ASO is actually part of the DNA polymer conjugate, which will hopefully assemble into FANA SNAs and we can uh, um, study the behavior of such SNAs. So, uh, so the first thing that we discovered actually is that uh, the spacer plays a critical role uh, in the activity of these SNAs. And what we realize is that you actually need a cleavable spacer in between the DNA, uh, the DNA or ASO portion and the polymer portion in order to have full activity compared to the, uh, to, compared to the ASO by itself. And here we're showing you in red that the SNA uh, that had the cleavable spacer had the most activity in comparison to no spacer SNA or non-cleavable spacer SNA. The second thing we uh, also showed that SNA actually improves the activity of the therapeutic, uh, especially when we uh, supply cells with a lower dose, here shown at around 50 nanometer, the SNA had higher activity than the ASO by itself. Next, we wanted to show that indeed these SNAs are modular in their design, so basically you change the sequence of the ASO that of the associate can target a different target. And here I'm showing you on the left when we targeted survivin, which is a key uh, a gene for the survival of cancer cells, the SNA targeting uh, survivin to choose the most apopto apoptosis in cancer cells compared to the other samples. And on the right, I'm showing you um, when we targeted uh, ApoB protein in HabG2 cells, and also the SNA showed uh, the most silencing out of the, all, uh, out of the other samples as well. So indeed, our SNAs are effective and modular against many targets. And last but not least, what we think is the key advantage of this design is that we showed that the SNA spacer actually had the highest silencing activity compared to all the other samples when we used them uh, uh, in a transfection-free experiment. And uh, that's actually attributed to the transfection-free uptake characteristics of and SNAs uh, and, uh, uh, by themselves individually, and then when you combine them together, you further boost this transfection-free activity of SNAs. And by that, I come to the conclusion of uh, this project where hopefully I was able to show you that we have a simple and modular design to produce final modified SNAs, and we discovered that the cleavability is key for the activity of such structures, as well as we improve the free uptake activity when we combine chemical modifications with, uh, uh, with spherical structures. Last but not least, uh, uh, the project where we try to change the conjugate and, uh, and then study its behavior, which is the in vivo studies of DDNA. So if you remember the sequence control polymer um, uh, method that we developed in our lab where we add different monomers of polymers, in one instance where we make a dendritic uh, um, polymer instead of a linear polymer uh, shown here. So this is the dendritic moiety that we have developed uh, um, 
in the lab. Rudy actually has worked on this dendritic moiety, and she discovered that actually it binds albumin in nanomolar affinity, which is very interesting. And then even if you position, for example, multiple of these dendritic moieties on a DNA cube, that you further increase um, the binding towards albumin. And this is interesting to study, mainly because we all know that once you inject a therapeutic inside the body or in vivo, uh, you, there's a protein corona that forms around, um, around this therapeutic or around the conjugate. And if we're actually able to bind albumin, which is the most abundant uh, protein in the serum, uh, we can actually try to hijack its biodistribution profile and to see if that's actually advantageous or not. Also, it's been reported that uh, albumin passively accumulates in tumor uh, by itself, so maybe we can use this to uh, deliver therapeutics to the tumor more effectively. So what we decided to do is to collaborate with the Khobarova lab um, in order to perform these in vivo studies of the dendritic conjugate. So first, what we decided to do is to conjugate an siRNA uh, to, uh, to this dendritic moiety, and we also compared uh, the d siRNA to another conjugate, which is docosanoic acid, a well-studied conjugate in the literature. So we're going to be comparing the d siRNAs to DCA siRNAs. And first, what we saw actually is that if we inject these conjugates in mice and we collect um, uh, the serum and we do a, a protein profiling of the serum using uh, says exclusion chromatography, we actually see that the DDNA is only exclusively binding albumin, which is a very a reassuring confirmation that this, this behavior is happening in vivo. Next, what we want to test is to see do siRNAs actually, uh, the siRNAs that are conjugated with the dendritic point still have their activity. So what we did is we injected mice systemically um, with dsRNAs and DS and, and the other conjugate. And we after one week, uh, we collected uh, different organs and we, want, and we saw that actually dsRNAs that are targeting Huntington are, uh, are able to silence um, their target uh, in a comparable fashion uh, to DCA to the DCA conjugate. And we can see here uh, silencing activity in the back skin, the liver, heart, fat, and adrenal glands. And this actually correlated uh, well with uh, the biodistribution uh, of, of uh, the dsRNA, which was also comparable to uh, the DCA conjugate. So this confirms that uh, the, D the conjugate is not hindering the activity of the sRNAs, and we do have activity in a variety of organs, which is worth exploring in the future. Next, what we wanted to test actually if we inject the dsRNAs using a local injection in comparison to a, a, a systemic injection. So in this experiment in collaboration with uh, Professor Watts and Dr. Shin, uh, we injected dsRNAs that are able to sign CD47 uh, in gene, and uh, we did that using a lung local injection. And what we are able to see actually is that the dsRNA was able to improve the silencing activity in specific cell types in the lung, such as leukocytes and epithelial cells. So uh, this showed that we do have enhanced activity in specific cell types. The work uh, for this project uh, is ongoing, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have any more recent data to show you, but we're working on it. And the future work on this project actually includes um, assessing uh, the multivalency of these conjugates, so for example, placing them on cubes, as well as further studying the increased activity in specific cell types, and uh, eventually investigating in tumor models and tumor delivery conclusion of my talk. I hope that you have enjoyed it. I'll be happy to answer your questions during the conference. Please reach out to me and thank you so much. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting talk, Hassan. So I had a question about whether this would also work for siRNA, but in your last part of the presentation, you already answered that, that question. I have a question from the, from the chat. Um, and Dr. Dutta says, great talk. How does the variable changes the, S I, uh, the SNA nanoparticle size, uh, which in turn can affect activity. Thank you, Anamika, and thank you, uh, Drew, for the question. So uh, it does indeed change the size, but because this is only a four nucleotide spacer, so the only two nanometers, we have tested longer ones such as eight and other uh, spaces such as HAG, and those uh, to a much uh, to a greater extent, but not something that is like crazy. They're all still like within twenty years in diameter. And um, what about the efficiency of spherical um, uh, NAs after administration? Uh, we haven't yet. Uh, unfortunately, 
I'm nearing the end of my PhD, but that's definitely one of the things that I want to pursue after is to do the yeah. in vivo studies of these SNAs. Yeah. And then Leon Lee says, is the conjugated moiety interfering with the um, I don't believe so. We haven't tested directly any uh, of SNAs towards their conjugate, but for example, in the first project, uh, we cannot hybridize uh, all the strands on the SNA uh, um, corona. We can only hybridize by around 60 to 70% of them, and that's probably due to steric hindrance on the corona. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll do the last question in view of time, and that's Aurelie de Acquart, and she says, I'm uh, amazing to see it in vivo, I agree. Uh, have you looked at the different linkers between the dendritic part and the oligo? Uh, we did not specifically uh, study that for the dendritic. Because of other previous results and the SNA results, we definitely adopted a cleavable linker for the dendritic moiety in comparison to the old studies. And that's why we see this high activity like that's comparable to the other uh, SRNAs that we, we compared it to. Yeah. So more questions are coming in, but in view of time, we have to move on. So you can probably answer them later. But what I would like you is to show your, uh, your award. Everyone in the audience can give you a virtual applause. You'll hear mine, but imagine that there's hundreds of people applauding for you for this achievement. Thank, thank you so much for the, for the OTS Society. I'm really honored to have this uh, award. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, We'll move to the next uh, award winner, and this is the postdoctoral post uh, fellow award again, the Alan Gobert Memorial Scholarship. Um, and this one goes to Kotaro Yoshioka, and Kotaro um, received his PhD um, from the uh, Dental University in 2016. And he developed a unique double stranded ASO technology called heteroduplic oligonucleotides. Um, and amongst others, this technology allows you to reach the brain quite efficiently after injection. And if you want details, there's a really nice uh, Nature Biotechnology paper out about that um, in, uh, from health. So, uh, uh, Katoro, it is well deserved. I know it's, it's close to 1 p.m., in, uh, 1 a.m. in Japan right now. So, we're looking forward to your talk and thank you for, for being here to answer our questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Kotaro Yoshioka from Tokyo Medical and Dental University. First of all, I'm honored to receive Dr. Gilbert's Memory Scholarship Award, and I would like to appreciate the organizing committee of OTS meeting for giving me the opportunity to present our research. In this talk, I would like to share my research about our new double standard oligonucleotide technology, heteroduplex oligonucleotides especially targeting CNS by intrathecal tube to expand celebrity window. As you know, celebrity oligonucleotides have been developed for treatment of intractable CNS disease. One of the best known AS drugs, nusinilacin, is marketed now in over 40 countries. Nusinilacin is SO for spinal cord muscular atrophy, which affects mainly spinal cord. In contrast, most ASOs for CNS disease have been developed to target brain rather than spinal cord. However, intrathecal delivery of ASO to brain is more challenging than to spinal cord. So development of efficient DDS to brain is one of the major challenges of ASO therapy for CNS. Let me explain another strategy of CNS that is individual therapy. The patient customized ASOs such as Muratin have emerged as one of the most promising modalities of end of one therapy targeting CNS disease. Actually, clinical development of several patient customized ASOs have started for CNS rare disease in USA and Netherlands. For this development, one of the biggest obstacles is CNS toxicity of ASO. ASOs, especially with phosphorosyroidate PPS modification, cause severe and often lethal CNS toxicity via injection to CS phase. As Roche's group reported in the previous OTS meeting, more than 50% ASOs have CNS toxicity. 
In addition, patient customized ASO target mainly severe rapid progressive disease. They do not have enough time to select tolerable ASO. To overcome these two challenges, efficient delivery to brain and mitigation of CNS toxicity, we have developed new double-stranded oligonucleotide technology named as heteroduplex oligonucleotide, HDO. As you know, most types of ASO is single-stranded DNA and sRNA is double-stranded RNA. In contrast, the HDO compromises DNA-based ASO and its complementary RNA strands, so double-stranded DNA RNA strands. Let me introduce the development of HDO technology to tackle the first challenge, efficient delivery to brain. At first, we tried to increase efficacy in brain by HDO conjugated with lipid ligand tocopherol. However, this HDO with tocopherol could not improve the drug delivery as well as silencing efficacy. To overcome this limitation of HDO technology, we designed a new concept, double-stranded ASO, to enhance aging silencing efficacy using only oligonucleotides, as named overhang heterodeuxed oligonucleotide, ODO. ODO is the duplex oligonucleotide with overhanging portion in the complementary RNA strand. When we administer this overhanging HDO into mice with intracellular ventricular ICV route, the ODO increased the AS accumulation and silence efficacy in the brain compared with the parent single stranded ASO. Next, we aim to mitigate CNS toxicity by HDO technology. For clinical application, CNS toxicity is one of the biggest problems. This slide shows an example of ASO toxicity. As you can see here, when one MOE GAPA type ASO is injected into mouse by ICB root, uses a rosal of a mouse and abnormal motor function. Particularly, ASO with RNA causes more severe toxicity as a right mouse, no responsiveness, and abnormality breathing. This type of toxicity is often lethal. To administer ASO into human, we usually select intrathecal IT root. When ASO injected into my key via IT root, ASO distributes more abundantly in lumbar spinal cord than cervical spinal cord or brain. The monkey injected with toxic ASO through IT root shows more frequently fair type of dysfunction in lumbar spinal cord, such as lower rib dominant paralysis. So as you can see, this monkey, who was administrated with toxic lower rib dominant paralysis and low also. So CNS toxicity, critical issues, even in the case of IT root. In the contrast, our new duplex technology, HDO, mitigates this CNS toxicity of SO by ICV injection. As you can see, these mouse movies, Mouse injected with the single stranded ASO shows severe toxicity, but when mouse injected with HDO with compromised toxic ASO and the complement RNA strand, middle mice shows positive responsiveness and portal function, so he can walk with mild ataxia, swaying, and breathe normally. And another type of HDO using complementary DNA strand mitigates similarly the CNS toxicity, as you can see the right side mice. Next, we design new type of HDO using modified complementary strand, that is second generation HDO. Surprisingly, this second generation HDO enhance the mitigation effect by HDO significantly. So uh, injected with this type of HDO might show perfectly normal responsiveness and motor pain. This slide shows our two methods to measure CNS toxicity quantitatively using the scoring system named Acute Therapy Scoring System, ATSS, which based on the top 10 from Rush 
Additionally, we assess locomotor activity by open field test using video tracking software. This graph shows acute autority score of mice injected with oligonucleotides. First generation HDO with RNA or DNA strand reduced the score by half of SO, and mice with second generation HDO show almost zero on the score. Toxicity in monkey administered by ITLU. You can see the left side monkey, the single send is so induced severe toxicity. In contrast, HDO mitigates CNS toxicity in monkey as well as mice. The monkey can stand that unable to walk, but some type of HDO show almost no toxicity. Walk around and, and jump up. Summarize these results, HDO mitigates CNS toxicity in mice by ICV root and toxicity in monkey by and HDO mitigates CNS tox in a dose dependent manner. HDO decreases nowhere by more than 30 fold compared with the parent similar strategy ASO. In addition, HDO enables a similar potency of knockdown efficacy compared with the single strategy ASO. Summarize these findings, HDO enables the expansion of therapeutic window significantly. Next. I guess that one question would hit on everybody. So why can HDO mitigate CNS toxicity? From findings of investigation of CNS toxicity using HDO, we introduce a hypothesis of HDO toxicity mitigation. In this experiment, we introduce two types of two mismatch in complementary strand against running in ASO strand. One of these mismatch the HDO, HDO mismatch one forms a duplex despite the two missed GC base pairings. This HDO mismatch one showed higher CNS toxicity than original pre-matched HDO. This result indicates guanine cytosine based pairing is more important than duplex formation in a cell. From this result, we focused on nucleobase and cytop hydrogen bond formation. Nucleobase, especially guanine, has many sites of hydrogen bond formation. We have said that this hydrogen bond formation induced the bond with protein which causes CNS toxicity. When Watson Crick base pairing is formed in duplex of oligonucleotides, such as HDO, this base pairing decreases size of hydrogen bond formation, resulting in reduction of binding proteins which cause CNS toxicity. This slide summarizes our hypothesis of a mitigation mechanism. Base pairing between ASO and the complementary strand in HDO decreased sites of hydrogen bond formation in nuclear bases of PSASO and reduced binding to toxic proteins. Finally, we investigate what type of protein is associated with CNS toxicity. And we found an agonist against some kinds of receptor mitigates CNS toxicity. And you can see that this graph and we field test results. In addition, the antagonist against same receptor make worse the CNS toxicity. So these findings indicate that ASO inhibit the receptor resulting in neural toxicity. In summary, 
Overnight type HDO enables increased delivery and silencing efficacy of ASO in frame. And binding complementary strand first generation HDO shows a moderate mitigation effect on acute sense toxicity by single tended ASO. And we found second generation HDO, which enables more efficient application of BCNS toxicity in mice and no human primate with a reducing silencing potency, resulting in expansion of cinematic window by more than 30 fold. This mitigation effect of HDO is closely related to base pairing, which may inhibit hydrogen bond formation, inducing bind to toxic molecule. I'd like to thank for the, all the members of the Octa's lab, Tokyo Medical Dental University, especially Susan, Jason, Emerson. Thank you for watching my talk. Thank you very much, Kotaro. That was a great presentation. Um, and I have a very similar uh, uh, question that, that David Corrin also asked. Um, and it's about how much further optimization can you do with different overhangs, uh, different chemistries? Um, and, and David also, he asked how many did you compare? And I would like to ask, well, how are there others that you plan to compare? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. I've, I read several types of AIDS being the RNA or MOV that sit around the more than the 10 so we next checked that uh, all MOE backgrounds or the, the, such as the, uh, every ASO, we believe that uh, double strand mechanism effect on the uh, all types of ASO regardless of the chemical modification. So, um, so you, you Mismatch. Is that something that you want to play around with further, or do you think that you understand enough now to, to really optimize this? Or yes, we have with the many threat organization uh, on the company that such as including the attack and communication with a threat secondary over to mitigate CNCC and enhance the efficacy in the cells. So we, we are going now. And uh, a question from Steve, uh, probably a question that everyone has. What is the, the, the enhanced delivery by these double-stranded oligomers? Yes, that's an important <laughs> question. I have studies about that uptake and, and protein binding. So we have not proved it totally, but uh, double-strand structure changed the binding in the CSF and the bind in protein on the su uh, cell surface, it uh, it makes the change on the uh, the toxicity, some the structure and uh, binding hybrid uh, hybrid bond bond is uh, very important for the mechanism. I think. And then um, there's a question from uh, Neges Aris. He or she says, what specific delivery that you use, or which route of administration that you use? Yes, this is about it. So we use the input and intrathecal loop so that uh, it moves through the CSS space. And may I answer the question? Yeah, I think so. Um, you compared intras. Uh, delivery and intravenous um, delivery, I think. Um, and a question from John Watts, uh, great work. Uh, about the mismatch versus the base pairing, how do you know that your native predicts the inside the Oh, yes, that's it. Nice question. We, we try to the self assay in the, using the restaurant so, uh, or you go using the fluorescence. So we did not yet prove that the double stand with mismatch uh, not did confirm the confirm, uh, double 
understand cell. But I think that the double strand in the gel uh, very, very complex. So that forms. So we we reject in the cells. Lots of questions popping in, but I'm going to pick just one because we don't have more time and then you can hopefully ask, answer the rest uh, in the chat. So the last question that I've selected is from, from if you do a Galmec conjugated HDO, would that further push the delivery of the ASO to the liver and away from the kidney due to binding? Can you speculate about that? Yes, I think that right. So tocopherol or uh, cholesterol conjugate HDO uh, delivered it more efficiently uh, using that uh, repeat. Uh, so Galenax is also effective on that uh, delivery, I think. So thank you very much. Like I said, there are additional questions and hopefully you can answer them uh, in the chat. But now I would like to first ask you to show your award so that we all have a applause. Um, with this well-deserved. So you'll hear my applause, but again, imagine there is hundreds of people watching and they're all applause now. Thank you so much for the OTS and the, uh, the member of the committee. I really appreciate it. Well-deserved. Thank you. And now we, we continue with the last uh, award, and that's the Marianne Liebert Award for the Young Investigator. Um, and well, you just heard two uh, Young Investigator Awards, but this is for the Young Investigator, the Junior PI Award. Um, and this year's uh, winner, oh, sorry, this is sponsored with the official journal. Like I said yesterday, we welcome all submissions uh, about everything to do with oligonucleotide therapies. So this, uh, uh, Marianne Lee, this award and Alex Garanto. Um, and Alex uh, was actually born on the same time, just in a He got his PhD uh, from the University of Barcelona in 2011. And in Spain, he moved to the Netherlands to John, join the group of Rob Collins at the Radboud University in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Um, he's been involved in the development of oligonucleotide therapies for inherited retina diseases, and he also studies uh, splicing and cryptic, cryptic splicing mutations. He became a group leader in, in 2020, and he's currently focusing on developing molecular therapies for inherited neurometabolic diseases and inherited uh, retinal diseases. So, Alex, the floor is yours. Looking forward to your presentation. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world you are right now. Today, we'll talk about antisense oligonucleotides to treat inherited retinal diseases. I would like to start my presentation with acknowledgements. And first, I would like to thank the OTS committee for awarding me with the Young Investigator Award 2021. Of course, this would not have been possible without the help and support of many people, starting with my PhD and postdoc supervisors who believed in me, my many other colleagues with who I share the passion for science. These are my disclosures. And I will start with a little bit of background. So the eye is the organ that allows us to see what happens around us. And this occurs because at the back part of a complex neuronal tissue called retina, that converts the light stimuli into electrical and chemical signals that travel to the brain where eventually they interpret and generate. In patients suffering from inherited retinal diseases, what happens is that during the first or second decade of life, patients ex start experiencing a progressive loss of vision until eventually they become completely blind. Inherited retinal diseases, or in short IRDs, are monogenic rare diseases characterized by a high genetic heterogeneity. This means that mutations in several genes can lead to the same IRD. And overall, each mutation on its own, it's ultra rare only found in a couple of families. Despite we know more than 250 genes involved in IRDs, around 30 to 35% of the patients remain unsolved, and therefore they are not eligible for any potential gene therapy that will be developed in the coming years. Furthermore, these diseases are progressive, 
And that means that we have a window of opportunity where we can act. The eye has been at the forefront of therapeutic development because it's easily accessible. It's contained, whatever we deliver to the eye stays in the eye. The retina is formed by non-dividing cells, meaning that the compound will not be diluted in each cell division. However, this is also negative because if there are no cells left, the treatment will not be effective. Um, also, the eye is an immunoprivileged organ. The immune response is rather low. There's a window of opportunity, as I already mentioned. And in case of a clinical trial, the readouts are non-invasive. And more important, we have two eyes, so each individual can be its own control and only one eye needs to be treated. Antisense oligonucleotides have been explored for several subtypes of IRD. In this table, we can see seven genes that have been targeted with AON, and at this moment, some of them are already in clinical trials. From these seven, five have been, um, well, targeted to correct splicing defects, while the other two, the aim was to degrade the transcript in a situation uh, where the mutation was causing a dominant negative effect. When we talk about splicing defects, we refer to alterations in the pre-mRNA splicing. In the normal situation, insons should be removed and all exons should be pasted together in order to be able to synthesize a functional protein. But we can have mutations in the splice site, and this can lead to exon skipping. In this case, exon 2 is not included in the final transcript. We can have an exon elongation where a critic splice site in the intron is recognized and the, the normal splice site is not. And that means that we have then the insertion of a small piece of the intron. Or we can have the most uh, extreme case where the entire intron is inserted. In all three cases, the transcript most probably will be out of frame and will be degraded and there will be no protein. But we also have other type of mutations, the deep intronic variants that have been ignored during many years. And those usually activate or create a splice site and therefore a piece of intron is recognized as an exon and it's included in the final transcript disrupting the reading frame again and not producing a functional protein. So what are the challenges to identify those deep intronic variants. So first of all, the sequencing. During many years, we thought that mutation should be in the coding region, and therefore, we never sequenced the introns. Nowadays, with techniques like whole genome sequencing, we are allowed to sequence those introns, but then we end up with an enormous amount of variants that we don't know how to interpret. Luckily, there are every day more and more uh, bioinformatic tools that allow us how to interpret these variants. However, how to know if they are causative or not, that's another problem, because most of the genes involved in IRDs are exclusively expressed in the retina, and we cannot culture the retina or directly in a, in a dish. And for that, we use other models, but we also know that the splicing differs between the retina and other cells, like, for example, hex cells. And this also complicates the development of possible therapeutic com uh, compounds like AUNs because we don't have a model where we can test it. To circumvent that, we have developed a MIDI genes or maxi genes that are big pieces of the gene of interest where we can also introduce the variant of interest and we can transfect uh, those plasmids into hex cells and then analyze the splicing. And I will come back to this in a minute. And thanks also to um, the technology, the Jamanaka vectors, nowadays we can obtain fibroblasts from patients, reprogram them to iPS cells, and we have the protocols to differentiate those iPS cells into retinal cells. I will focus the rest of my presentation talking about a specific disease, target disease. And this is the most frequent juvenile macular dystrophy affecting one every 10,000 individuals. Like all the other IRDs, it's a progressive disease, and it's caused by biallelic mutations in the ABCA4 gene. And ABCA4 is a relatively big gene with 50 exons and more or less 7 kb of coding region, where more than 2,000 unique variants have been described so far. It encodes for the ATP binding cassette subfamily A member 4, which is a transmembrane, transmembrane protein involved in the visual cycle. If we have a look to all these variants, the big majority are missense variants, followed by protein truncating variants. Interestingly, around 20% of these variants affect splicing, and remarkably, 11% are deep intronic variants. These deep intronic variants are distributed along the entire gene, 
and can be classified in deep internal variants, those that are really in the middle of the intern and usually generate a pseudo exon insertion, or those that are in the intern but relatively close to the exon and usually generate an exon elongation. Going back to the MIDI gene system I mentioned before, just to recapitulate, it's a large piece of the gene that is cloned into a plasmid with two flanking exons that we know how the splicing work. We can transect this in head cells, and therefore by RT-PCR, we can analyze what's happening. And in this example, we are amplifying from exon seven to eight, and then we see this is the wild type transcript, and then we see that there's a tiny bit of uh, wild correct transcript in the, when we are studying the variant of interest, and there's a bigger band that when we sequence, we could identify a pseudo exon with clear uh, splicing sites. Using this system, we have been able to characterize almost all the variants that we have identified. But more importantly, we have been able to perform antisense oligonucleotide screenings. So in this case, we have a near exon variant uh, that it's in intron 13, and it creates an exon elongation of 36 nucleotides. We have designed two different antisense oligonucleotides, and we have tested them in the wild type and in the mutant. In the wild type, as you can see in this gel, we could not detect any uh, splicing defect. While in the mutant, what we could see is that when it's not treated, the band is higher because of the insertion of this exon elongation of this extra 36 nucleotides. And, that, uh, and this splicing defect is uh, corrected upon treatment with AON1 or AON2. In the case of AON2, there's partial redirection, as we can see the two bands, the, the one with the elongation and the one that it corresponds to the correct transcript. The sense oligonucleotide did not produce any rescue. But we can also do it with the pseudoexon uh, uh, insertions caused by deep intronic variants. And this is uh, the easiest uh, way. And um, in this case, we have a pseudoexon of 127 nucleotides. We have designed two different molecules. And again, we were able to see that in the wild type situation, there's no splicing defect. But in the mutant situation, in this case, we have the insertion of two pseudoexons. I don't know if you can appreciate that there are two bands. And the, the splicing uh, is redirected upon treatment with antisense, well, with the AUN1 and AUN2. However, we have found limitations in this system too. So we were studying a cluster of variants in intron 36, and those, all those variants were found individually in different patients and we performed the MIDI gene assay. And what we could observe for this variant, M9, is that where, when we analyzed the results, there was barely uh, no pseudoexon insertion. And in a normal situation, we would have said, mm, this variant probably is not causative. However, this is the, most, the second most frequent uh, intronic variant, and it segregates really well with the disease. So therefore, we would decided to go one step further, and we had the chance to obtain uh, patient cells. And in this case, it was a patient, a compound heterozygous patient. So one allele had this intronic variant and the other allele had an exonic variant. So we uh, reprogrammed these fibroblasts to IPS and differentiated them to photoreceptor precursor cells or PPCs that are retinal-like cells. And what we observe is that in the control line after upon um, inhibition of the nonsense mediated decay with cycloxamide, we could observe a little bit of pseudoexon. However, when we checked the patient, we could see that already without cycloxamide, the pseudoexon insertion was quite clear. And when we blocked the nonsense mediated decay, the pseudoexon was more or less in a ratio one to one compared to the normal transcript. So knowing this, we decided to use these cells to do an AON, to perform an AON screening where we designed four different AONs and we tested them in uh, PPCs, in retinal-like cells. And these are the results. So we could see that in the wild type, in the control line, uh, again, there was almost no pseudoaxon insertion as we observed before. And the pseudoaxon insertion was really clear in the patient. And what we could observe is that AON six and seven we're able to redirect splicing because the upper band that is the one including the pseudoexon was fainter and the lower one that is the correct one increased. So overall, using all these systems, 
In the last years, we have been able to develop uh, AUN for more than 25 ABCA4 variants affecting splicing. But what's next? In our group, we want to bring uh, these molecules to the clinic and benefit patients. But we want, we want to also understand which chemistry might be the most suitable one for the retina. So in our studies, we started with the 2 omed and we switched to the 2 moe, and then we wanted to see what was the difference. And for that, we decided to compare also with the PMOs and check what will happen in the cellular models and in the mouse retina. And for the cellular models, uh, we already have the results, and so far the 2 moe was the most efficacious one, followed by the 2 omed and we are currently characterizing the mouse retinas to know which one uh, is more efficacious in vivo. To conclude, I would like to highlight that deep intronic variants explain most of the unsolved cases in our Stargard core, that pseudoaxone insertion is the main splicing defect identified, and that the splice assays using mitigants are very useful and robust tools to assess splicing defects and AON-mediated correction, despite several deep intronic variants showed retina-specific splicing defects. We have successfully rescued more than 25 splicing defects, and so far uh, we have been done to uh, check which chemistry was the most efficacious, the 2 omega phosphorothioate chemical modification was the most uh, efficacious. I would like to again thank in this research and my colleagues and uh, colleagues, also the funding bodies, and of course, all of you for being here, and if you have any question, I will be happy to take it in a few minutes live. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, for that great. Um, so maybe I missed it, but we have AAV for a lot of eye diseases. So do we really need antisense oncogenucleotides? Well, I think this depends on what you want to target. That's uh, the, the main issue. I mean, ABC4 does not fit. So in this case, we should work and think about a dual A, B vector where you can deliver two parts and then put it at the same time. But the AONs for at least intronic variants that um, yeah, interfere with the splicing, it's a good uh, possibility because they also can be delivered easily to the retina. And while well, we know nowadays that it's safe and not toxic, so it's a good alternative for all those genes that do not fit in an AAB. That's a very nice lead into the next question from David Corey. So what is the longevity of the retina? And then a second question, um, instead of injecting, uh, is there a hope for topical delivery? Yes, so uh, the longevity at this moment, uh, I mean, in, in animals, it's known that it's up to six months, but nobody actually went further, or at least it's not really uh, investigated. Uh, at the current moment, the clinical trial, for instance, for septonite, dosing every three months, and now they also dose every six months. So at least uh, it's six months, and they uh, inject, a, let's say, a, not com the full dose, but it's part of it. And the other question about the topical, I think at this moment for oligos it, and other molecules, it might be a little bit challenging because uh, the topical directly to the cornea, that is the front part of the retina is completely at the back part. So it needs to cross the entire humor and the, the, those parts are um, full of proteases and RNAs that uh, retina itself from a external agents. So I don't know if in the coming, in the short term, we can deliver directly topically, but maybe in the it can be possible if we find a way to avoid all these proteases, arginases, et cetera. And then maybe a, a, a more uh, a translational question. If you have people, I mean, these are eye diseases, what do you think? Can you only use this in really newly? Or can you also use it in patients that have more advanced um, uh, loss of, of visual function? Well, I, I think at, at some point it will depend on how many cells are left. Because you can have a very severe uh, and then be still junk and recently diagnosed but not having any photoreceptor left and uh, be older and still have photoreceptors left. And um, in fact, for the, the also for the SEP290 trial, one of the patients had experienced, um, yeah, a 
an improvement, it's actually one of the oldest ones injected. So you never know. It was surprising also for the ophthalmologist. So there's a lot that we don't know yet. So there's, there's people you in the, in the chat as well, so you, you can have a look afterwards. But now I'm going to ask you to please show your reward so that I can give you a real applause <laughs> and all the, other, all the other people can give you their virtual applause. So congratulations. Um, and with that, we end this session. So again, congratulations to all the winners.